All right, I hope everyone had a good lunch. So next up we have uh, Ryan Brush, and he's going to talk about near real-time processing over edge base. Over to you. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to jump in. So at this point, I'm just uh, happy that I got through lunch without a line of gravy down the front of my shirt. So uh, I figure that the rest of the presentation should be uh, downhill from here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, over HBase, uh, specifically uh, doing low latency processing over it. Um, so we're going to cover a few things. Uh, one is uh, how the needs for doing real-time processing over HBase uh, emerged, some of the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, we're going to talk about complementing MapReduce and stream-based processing uh, over these technologies, uh, some techniques that, and, that we learned along the way and, and some lessons that we learned along the way. Um, we're going to touch on uh, some ways that we're doing queries and searches uh, against uh, the data that we process, and then some uh, notes on, on where I th we think that a lot of this is actually going. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in with the, the story so far. Uh, so our, our first use of Hadoop um, was building a, a solution called Chart Search. Um, so uh, really what, what uh, Cerner does is uh, we, we're uh, focused on uh, healthcare and technology around healthcare. Uh, so one of the things that we found is that a lot of clinicians had a really hard time finding the appropriate clinical information uh, to look at the history of their clients. Uh, so we wanted to solve that by making the medical charts searchable, um, which believe it or not took a long time for the healthcare industry to achieve. Uh, so we do some interesting things here. Um, uh, and all on t using Hadoop to leverage this. Um, so one is that uh, we aggregate data into Hadoop and we uh, do things like information extraction uh, from, from clinical documents or clinical notes. Uh, we'll do semantic markup of clinical documents. Uh, so if somebody has uh, a, a myocardial infarction uh, in their clinical document and I do a search for heart disease, I really want that document that has myocardial infarction to come back. So uh, we do semantic annotation of that. Um, which is the results in those related concepts in the searches. And uh, all of this, since we are dealing with generally historical data about a patient, uh, we processing latency of tens of minutes is generally okay. So that was working pretty well, and then we decided, well, we got all this data together. Um, wouldn't it be great if we can do some more stuff with it? Uh, so we started looking at doing uh, medical alerts of data that we're bringing together in the cloud. I don't expect you to read this diagram. It's just an example of, uh, of, of some of the logic that we'll, we apply. Um, so uh, giving this incoming data, we want to be able to detect patients that are, uh, have certain health risks um, based on either literature or on, on uh, research that we've done to indicate that they may have issues. Uh, we want to notify clinicians uh, about those risks, uh, so and, and then uh, quickly include new knowledge uh, to improve that. So an example that we've actually rolled out uh, is uh, detecting patients that are at a high risk of sepsis. So based on vital signs, lab results, a number of other measures, we can detect when a patient is, uh, has a good probability of being septic. Um, and what's interesting is this solution has actually saved lives. We've actually been able to bring in these bring these pieces of information together, uh, detect this in the cloud, and then send a notification back to the source system so the clinician can intervene appropriately. Uh, so of course, our processing demands only get stronger uh, as we start rolling, so roll these out. So rather than tens of minutes uh, for a chart search solution uh, in terms of processing, we're now we really need to be single digit minutes or, or faster. So you can probably guess where this is going next. It's like, well, we have all this data in the cloud. We want to look at it as it happens, as it gets updated. Uh, so here's a couple uh, uh, screenshots from an iPad application that, that, uh, that we're continuing to build uh, that uh, allows novel ways of exploring the medical records. So what's interesting is that there's a lot of uh, healthcare information systems out there, uh, and all of which have their own representation, their own structure uh, of the medical records. And what happens is that oftentimes the way a clinician wants to view it or explore it may not na naturally align with the structure, um, the way that the data models persisted in the source system. So we actually uh, use this Hadoop ecosystem to build pre-computed models uh, that match the way the access patterns that users have the system. So if I want to look at data in a certain way, we can compute a model, a data model that's optimized to explore that certain data way. 
uh, in that way. And the result is a very fast load times. So you can bring up this iPad app and just flip through uh, all kinds of history, all kinds of information about a patient that normally would take you know, multiple seconds uh, uh, in order to, to compute that. So since we want to explore real data, well, our latency uh, demands get even stronger. Um, we need to be able to process uh, incoming data enters the system. We need to process it and make it available to users in seconds. Uh, so at this point, we're out of the realm of a, what we could typically do with a, a, a Hadoop MapReduce Bake ecosystem. And of course, there's a lot of others uh, that are continuing to pop up in terms of doing uh, care coordination, analyze the health of populations, coming up with personalized health plans. Um, our data sets are growing fast. We're getting hundreds of gigabytes every day into the system. Uh, we're approaching a petabyte of, of uh, total data, and uh, the rate is only increasing. So um, by the, uh, we, total, we expect that we're going to be dealing with multiple petabytes, uh, if not this year, then, then definitely in the coming years. Uh, so what we have here with this uh, is a trend towards these competing needs, where some of these problems really call for the need to analyze entire sets of population data holistically in order to answer questions about those. But other of these problems need us to quickly apply incremental updates. So if something new, some new piece of information about a patient occurs, we need to be able to take that information, we need to be able to update those views so they can be explored. Uh, and these really are a trend uh, towards competing needs uh, in that for MapReduce processing, we grab all the data. Uh, with stream-based processing, we'll only get, grab individual updates. Um, in what, at MapReduce, we, it, you have to move the computation to the data because you can't, there's too much data to move around, where streams is the opposite. Um, and similarly, uh, MapReduce, the output is, is, is logically a pure function of your input in that you generally have uh, your set of input that you pass to a MapReduce job, you execute that function and then produce a very large output. Whereas streaming processing, you don't have a static state of the system. Uh, uh, things are changing around you. Um, and then and further with streaming processing, your incoming data may be incomplete and may be out of order uh, just based on the way that it streams into the system. And to make things even more complicated, both of these processing models uh, have to have the same underlying logic. Whether we construct a patient view or construct a search index uh, via a MapReduce job or apply incremental changes to it, uh, we need the same output. So how do we go about approaching this problem? Well, uh, the author of Storm, uh, Nathan Mars, has written fairly extensively about this, and he has a pretty good model of, of how to separate these needs. And so he tends to describe things, uh, take these two competing needs, the streaming incremental processing and the MapReduce needs, and keep them separate because they are very separate things. So I, I'm borrowing ter a terminology that Mars uses, the speed layer and the batch layer. I think at other times he might use the real-time layer and the batch layer, where our speed layer deals with hours of data. Um, uh, we need to move, it moves data to the computation, it's very low latency, whereas the batch layer, layer deals with many years of data, it can do bulk loads. Uh, so this pattern's working out pretty well. And uh, what we're doing is, this is kind of our incarnation of that pattern, uh, where we're using Twitter's Storm technology to do our incremental stream-based processing. We're using Hadoop and MapReduce to do that, the batch processing. And what you'll notice that's interesting in here is that Apache HBase, I kind of have it straddling the middle, um, because HBase provides some properties of both of these worlds. Uh, you can run MapReduce jobs directly against HBase and you get data locality since you can move your computation to the data. But at the same time, you can do incremental uh, updates, inserts, and you can do rand you have random access, random reads and writes uh, into HBase. Uh, so I really think that the best way to think about HBase uh, is it's really random access to the Hadoop distributed file system. And um, a lot of problems you do, for a lot of problems, you don't need that random access, but when you do need it, you really do. Um, and HBase is, is a good tool for that. So we'll talk about how some ways that we're using uh, HBase specifically in conjunction to these other technologies to solve this, this real-time processing. So let's uh, jump into uh, the rabbit hole. So, um, I'm going to take a ride through the system that we built and talk about uh, uh, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. So let's start at the top, and that is the first thing you have to do is get data into the system. 
Uh, and this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we simply have a set of HTTPS services that can accept content from um, a disparate set of data sources. Uh, some of these, uh, may, many of these live within our data center, but we also accept connections, authenticated secure connections um, from external clients, either over dedicated pipes or over the internet. Uh, so we stream data in. Uh, generally, at this point, uh, the content uh, that we're bringing in is stored as a protocol buffer. Uh, and this was largely done uh, at the time. Um, Thrift uh, w wasn't particularly mature, and uh, Avro, I'm not sure if it existed when we started doing this project. Uh, so I think any of those technologies that work, uh, protobuf at the time was our best option, um, and there hasn't been a, a sufficient need to, to change that. Uh, and one thing that's important to call out is that what we're trying to achieve at this point is we want to mirror the raw representation of the source's data as simply as possible. And um, the reason for that is, is uh, if there's any need to reprocess data, if there's, any, if there's a bug or an enhancement that we want to deploy, we want to push as much of our logic, as much as the complexity as possible into the cloud rather than in the systems that are sending or aggregating the data. Uh, so that way we can quickly deploy uh, any changes, rerun a set of MapReduce jobs and address them. So let's talk about how we're processing this, uh, this incoming data um, in real time. So uh, some of you, the, Google wrote a pretty good paper a handful of years ago uh, called Percolator. Uh, and in the percolator system, they described uh, some techniques they were doing in order to do much more low latency updates to their search index. Uh, and the gist of the percolator um, paper is that uh, it's built on Bigtable, which is you know, the, the uh, Google's, uh, which is the original source of the design for HBase. And the pattern is, is that you have a, a, a column family that's full of data, um, and then they have a column family that indicates uh, to which every time a specific cell of data is updated, they write what they call a notification. Uh, so your data may have you know, tens or hundreds of billions of rows, um, but over any given period of time, only a very small subset um, of those rows were actually changed. Uh, so every time something's changed, they write a notification and then have an external process, uh, Google calls them an observer, that scans your notification uh, table for changes so we know what to pick up and, and process. So uh, this works pretty well, and, and uh, so we basically, we've taken this pattern and applied it to HBase, but there's some catches. Um, the first is that the percolator style uh, for notifications requires uh, external coordination of the, the processes that are scanning and doing the work. Uh, since they're all scanning that notification table, multiple processes could grab the same item and want to process it uh, redundantly, uh, which is pretty inefficient. Um, it also, and that external coordination means more infrastructure to build, more infrastructure to maintain. Um, and so we wanted to find an approach in which we could use HBase's primitives rather than standing up additional infrastructure. So we've taken the, the Google's percolator model and evolved it somewhat to uh, what looks like this in that um, it's similar to uh, scanning for updates, but what we actually are doing is we actually have a specific uh, column in HBase that we use to manage the coordination of the processes of the observer processes. Uh, and, and since HBase supports, um, uh, supports atomic operations, what we can do is that if, yeah, when I, if I grab a set of items that I want to process, I can store all those items in a row and I can do it atomically claim a lease column in that row, a lease uh, qualifier in that row, then process that and when I'm done I unlock my, I release the lease um, that was claimed. And then lease has a timeout um, associated with it, so in case there's a process failure, that lease will uh, expire and somebody else can grab it and pick it up. Um, so this works pretty well. Uh, we were able to 3,000 notifications per second per node, um, which was sufficient uh, for our use cases. This, and it scales out, you, you can scale out to an arbitrary number of nodes. It generally scale, scales linearly with the size of your HBase cluster. Uh, so we, we found a number of advantages to this. One is that we didn't need to operate additional infrastructure outside of HBase, which you know, the operational considerations are a big deal. Um, the other big advantage is that it leverages the strong guarantees that HBase makes. So everything that's stored in HBase, all of your data is persisted in HDFS. 
replicated three times. So this means that we, there was no risk of any lost data, and there was no risk of data being stranded or unavailable due to a failure of a single machine. So if a machine or, uh, failed in the Hadoop cluster, Hadoop would detect that, re-replicate those blocks uh, across the cluster. Um, and so we were, we, uh, being in healthcare, uh, we had very strong requirements of, of data availability. Uh, so, so this was a big deal for us. And then the other advantage is that it's uh, robust to volume, very high volume spikes. Uh, so one of the great things about HBase is it handles write throughputs very well, uh, assuming that you distribute your writes fairly evenly across, the, uh, across many region servers in your cluster. Uh, so uh, if we had some client that was, uh, and, and this turned out to be important because uh, uh, it turns out that uh, the, the usage patterns that we've seen in our clients were very uneven. Um, there's certain, like, uh, if we're aggregating data from a particular data source, uh, they may run uh, batch jobs or batch imports that goes and updates a huge number of rows in the database and then brings that all onto our cluster. So uh, being able to absorb these very large volume spikes from our clients uh, was a big deal. And this actually, uh, I mean, this actually made it so we didn't have to create an artificial back pressure uh, on to the producers of our data uh, in this case. We didn't have to make that more complicated to the people that are sending the data. Um, we were able to just absorb those spikes uh, by spreading it out over an HBase cluster. Now there's some downsides as well. Um, one is weak, there, the ordering guarantees are weak in this leasing model um, in that we may get process data out of order. Um, uh, it also is essentially an at least once uh, processing model, and that everything that comes in gets persisted, it'll get picked up and processed, but if there's a failure, it may be processed uh, multiple times. So it's important that all of our processing logic be item potent, which is generally a good practice in, in large distributed systems anyway. Um, uh, lots of garbage from deleted cells. Uh, if you're not deeply familiar with HBase, when you do a delete, you don't really delete it. You mark it as pending for deletion. Uh, so as a result, uh, 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 garbage will pile up until you run a major compaction on it. So we have to schedule and manage major compactions. Um, and then we also have to aggressively uh, split data, uh, split these notification tables in order to avoid a hot region. It's really easy. If we were to, if we were to put all these, these rows on one region server, we would light up that region server and, and really limit our throughput and, and, potentially, and potentially starve users of it. Um, so, but you know, with these caveats, it, this turns out to be a fairly scalable and robust system. And the other downside that, that I want to call it is that I think that there are likely to be better options emerging. Uh, so uh, there was a great talk yesterday uh, about uh, Kafka and its replication uh, features that are coming in. Um, we're excited about that, and I think we're going to be evaluating that as an alternative to this notification, as a to drop this in in replace of this notification mechanism, uh, while keeping the rest of the architecture that we're describing uh, today the same. It's one of those things where. Um, yeah, we're working with, uh, with HBase, we're kind of pushing some of the limits on the typical usage patterns of HBase. And while we've been successful, we've had to, we, uh, I, won't say, I won't claim that all these things didn't come with a uh, fair amount of lessons learned along the way. Uh, so we definitely prefer to be using uh, open source projects in a way that's more broadly used in the community. Um, it, and since uh, Kafka seems like a good tool for this. So haven't used it yet, but we're going to be digging into it. Another thing that I want to call out this is the importance of really good measurements across the system. Uh, so here's a couple of screenshots. This is just a, a graphite uh, view of it. Um, so, but what we actually did is that uh, we took our the H-based client and. Um, which provides a nice Java interface that you can write your own implementations of. And we wrote an instrumented version of that Java interface that then passes through. Um, and we simply use the metrics API, uh, which is an excellent API if you're looking to do instrumentation in Java, um, and a graphite uh, reporter for that. And um, some interesting properties emerged from this in that uh, HBase, modern version of HBase, and Hadoop has really excellent instrumentation on the server side. You can look at any region server, you can look at you know, how its latency, its throughput, I mean, everything that's happening there. Uh, so you get a good piece of information for that. But what we found is that that didn't really reveal the full picture of our usage and our performance um, behavior when using HBase. And that what we're seeing is that uh, well, 
under load, under these real-time load, we saw these, a whole bunch of very, very short-lived uh, queues pop up uh, on the, our region servers. So a request would come in, it would just, it might be backed up because we didn't have enough request handlers uh, set up, but for, for a very short period of time. So we saw that we, from the, the region server perspective, and we're thinking, okay, well, you know, everything is going through, we're processing a ton of requests per second, um, this isn't a big deal. But when we instrumented the client side, all these very short-lived queues summed up to, to create a, a significant performance degradation in the consumer, from the consumer perspective of the system. Uh, so the point being is that uh, all the instrumentation that exists uh, on the server in Hadoop and HBase is great. You can learn a lot from it, but it's generally not sufficient. Um, so this basically revealed uh, the impact of, of some hot regions on our, on our cluster. Once we discovered this with this instrumentation, we were able to rebalance in our, and, uh, and adjust HBase's configuration, uh, which created a, a pretty significant uh, performance uh, impact. All right, so we'll tie back in. So, so here's the, the, uh, the story so far. Um, we bring data into the system, uh, and then we land it in HBase, and we initiate our process. We talk about how we initiate processing. Um, and so now we're going to talk about how we actually host and operate the, the logic and the process themselves, and so jumping into the storm. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with storm, I'll just touch on it really briefly. Uh, it's essentially just a, a scalable mechanism of processing data in motion. Uh, it's a complement to HBase and Hadoop. Uh, and that is focused on real-time and incremental processing. And uh, the killer feature of Storm, and the reason that we had jumped into it, uh, is it has excellent guarantees of message processing uh, in a distributed environment. Uh, so you can, you can uh, Google some references on, on Storm to talk about the mechanism it works, but essentially, once a message enters Storm, it, has a, uh, it can process through a topology of processing nodes and be emitted to the other uh, to some output. And Storm makes very strong guarantees that either the message will be processed um, uh, or if there is a failure, it can go and ask the data source for the message, hey, give it to me again so I can process it again later. Uh, so a lot of the uh, alternative uh, complex events processing type systems don't have these kind of strong guarantees. So, uh, so we looked at things like um, S4, we looked at a couple other CEPs, uh, some proprietary CEP systems. And, 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 and interestingly, uh, Storm was the only, only system like this that I'm aware of that provides these strong guarantees. Um, and so the way we essentially integrated with Storm is that we wrote our own Storm spout um, that pulls in, that scans uh, this notification table that I described earlier and then emits events across the storm cluster. This turns out to be pretty straightforward to do. Uh, it's just a storm spout that does HSpace scans against a table um, and then emits uh, output from it. So our, our picture uh, now looks like this. So this works fairly well, but of course there's uh, a number of challenges that are just intrinsic uh, to doing incremental updates and incremental processing. Uh, one is dealing with incomplete data and in that you're getting data one piece at a time, you may not have the whole picture. Now there's outdated state. Um, so a good example of this is if I, if I change my name from Smith to Jones, I have to go and I'm building a phone book, I have to remove the Smith entry from the phone book. Whereas in a MapReduce job, I just throw out the phone book and rebuild the whole thing, uh, which actually adds, it creates a number of complicated edge cases. Um, and also creates some timing and state conditions that can be difficult to reason about. So I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that we're, that, that, uh, we're using to handle these complexities of doing real-time processing. Um, so the first with regards to handling incomplete data. Um, so this is kind of a pattern that we've emerged. So imagine that uh, you have a, in a simple example, uh, you're, you're building a document that has multiple pages. So you're, and you have one page streaming into the system at a time. Uh, so page one enters the system, and, and remember, events can be entering the system out of order. So page one, then page three um, uh, enters the system. So what we're doing is that we're, each end of the page, we can map that into, uh, you know, do some pre-processing for the page, and then essentially merge those pages together to create the output uh, summary for our document. 
so what we're doing here is that in HBase, uh, since we can do those random access, those random reads, we're able to actually take data that may not be complete yet and stage it, uh, persist it off uh, in HBase so that when we have that complete document, we can merge them together to produce our output artifact. Uh, and so what's strange is that even though this isn't MapReduce in a Hadoop sense, um, these operations are fully analogous to a map function and a reduce function. We're mapping a raw page element to a process page element, and then we're reducing those sets of pages to an output document. So you can kind of use the same mental model. Um, and the so the result is, is that this is kind of a rolling map reduce as data enters the system. Uh, and, and the nice thing is, is that because it's the similar mental model to a Hadoop style map reduce, uh, a lot of the code is reusable between these processing infrastructures. And also call out is that many cases may not need a merge uh, phase and a consuming application could read all of the individual pages itself and merge it together at read time. And this is much like uh, how not all MapReduce jobs need a reduce phase. And in fact, it's MapReduce jobs that don't need a reduce phase are more efficient. Um, and so some, a lot of the same reasoning applies here. Uh, so the next one I want to touch on is dealing with outdated state. So uh, imagine the scenario in which um, we're building indexes of residents of Chicago, residents of New York. Um, so at time zero, Alice lives in Chicago. Um, uh, and so she would live in the, that index, and then at time one, she lives in New York, so she would exist in, in the other index. It seems like a pretty simple problem. So, how do you, so if, you're just, if you're dealing with a typical big data processing model, it's pretty straightforward. It's like uh, run a MapReduce job, and you rebuild both indexes from scratch, so outdated state is simply ignored. So we throw away the indexes, Alice New lives in New York, that index is updated. So it's very simple, very easy to reason about, which is one of the big advantages of MapReduce is the fact that we can reason about dealing with large data sets very simply. It's, it's really one of its values. So that works for big data. Now, if we're dealing with fast updates um, and we can fit something in an ACID database, you know, fit everything in some relational, completely normalized data, that's really simple too. It's like we simply update Alice's location from one spot to another. Um, but where we wanted to trouble is that if we have data that is very large that it can't fit all into a single coordinated database, um, uh, but it's coming in too fast to apply MapReduce style reprocess the world events, uh, this comes, becomes a challenge because neither of these simple and easy to understand processing metaphors can be applied in this context. Uh, so this gets really hard. Uh, so there's a couple techniques to do it. One is uh, what, I, what I'm referring to uh, as reconciling these on read, and this is akin to the Nathan Mars's lambda architecture that he, he speaks about sometime, um, in that uh, basically we can have uh, data stores that are optimized for specific workloads. Uh, so you can have your big data store for your MapReduce processing, you have a smaller store um, for your incremental updates, and then you simply merge the two items together at query time. So in this slide, I'm coloring things in green that are, are positives and red that are negatives. So, uh, so this is great because the data stores can be optimized for their workloads. They can do what they do well. You don't have to have one data store that does both real time and batch processing really well. It also keeps the processing model um, independent. Um, so I can run my, my batch processing and my real time processing topologies independently of one another. I don't have to worry about combining them together and, and all the race and timing conditions that occur uh, when dealing with that. It does add complexity at read time, um, but I think overall it's, it's, a, it's a slimper model than the alternatives. Um, but I think that uh, one of the big downsides is that this type of pattern isn't available in commodity web or application stacks. Um, it may emerge. So if, if your application stack is a, a popular web framework, if you're building a Django or a Ruby on Rails, um, you, you probably want to use you know, an existing data store that's well integrated with those app frameworks versus having to write code that merges you know, these two outputs together. Uh, so the result is, is that we lose the ability to use existing commoditized um, stacks with the need to, to build our own. Uh, but despite that drawback, I think that this probably is the best approach to solving this problem, um, particularly uh, when and if higher level abstractions emerge to solve this for us. Like, so right now, like, we have to write this merge logic ourselves. Um, 
there's no reason why this shouldn't be an abstraction where this data is transparently merged and nobody writing the application needs to be visible to it. Um, the technology that doesn't isn't widely available right now. I know that there are some uh, projects that are exploring that uh, as, that that be interesting to track. Um, one example is uh, um, Rich Hickey's company at Atomic is, is uh, using a model very similar to this. Um, so I'm kind of keeping eyes on that uh, with interest. Uh, so the alternative to that is is that to reconcile uh, data on right. So if we keep a history of our incoming data, uh, uh, so like I said, re remember in our HBase slide, we keep all of our raw data. So we have the fact that at time zero, Alice lived in Chicago, and at time one, Alice moved to New York. Uh, so what we can do is that when event at time one occurs, we can look at that whole history and then know, oh, I need to d remove Alice from the Chicago index um, and insert her into the New York index. So which is great because the, de the destination data store, I'm basically bending my process to meet the needs of that destination store. So I can use a commodity data store for a commodity web stack. Um, so that makes it easier there, but it adds significant complexity to the processing logic in that every time something comes in, I have to look at the history and I have to manually take care of obsolete state. Um, this, is, this complexity is... Uh, uh, can be a challenge to manage, um, and so this is a pretty significant downside to this. Um, we are doing this in a number of cases, um, but it's something you have to be very proactive to handle on, handle because it's um, it is it can be prone to error when you need to manually be updating two separate things. Um, so it's so whenever possible, I'd like to see patterns or frameworks to merge so they don't have to think about that. Um, we've done some of this internally. Um, it's been a challenge to generalize these patterns to 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 an arbitrary use case but um, maybe, maybe um, this will emerge at one point. And the other downside to that is that um, the data store uh, uh, that you're writing to must handle both MapReduce and real-time processing uh, versus being, having two separate data stores that are really optimized um, for these different models. <clears throat> so through all of this, we have the MapReduce and real-time processing, um, and they, and they, but they really have the same logic. Uh, and so, the implication here is that if you want to have the same logic between MapReduce and real-time processing, uh, the functions have to be the center of your universe. In MapReduce, we often think of terms of like input formats and output formats, or in, in a stream-based processing, you might think of things of messages. Um, but those aren't those do not intersect. They do not overlap between these two processing models. So the key is, is that really we need to write logic as pure functions as much as possible. So giving a defined input, we always produce the same output. And then we need to coordinate those functions with higher level libraries that can be deployed in either of these processing models. Uh, so our choices for the higher level libraries um, use, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Sto the STORM project. Um, and then we're also early adopters of the Apache Crunch, which uh, just became a top level project last week. We've been using it for several months now, um, doing our own builds out of the incubator. Uh, check out Apache Crunch if you need to coordinate uh, MapReduce jobs. It has a number of, uh, has a number of nice features, um, has very strongly typed uh, data structures that can be uh, uh, chained together. Uh, so, uh, and so since we deal a lot with things like protocol buffers, we're able to take our protocol buffers and, and build a strongly typed processing pipeline, passing them from one to another, um, and, and it creates a great development experience. So when we go through all this, one of the things that has to be going, coming to mind is that this is getting complicated, and complexity, this is a really big deal. Um, I mean, incremental processing logic and dealing with these states is very complex. It's error prone. Um, and and as our challenge is, uh, and since it's error prone, we need to make sure that we have a fail safe for that. And to that fail safe is MapReduce. So we take that original picture that we have, and we have the storm processing topology, um, but then we want to complement that with MapReduce. And this is an important aspect, I think, when designing real time processing, is you tend to might focus on the real time aspects of it. Um, but there's going to be a scenario in which something, you have a bug or you have an enhancement, you have something that goes wrong in your processing logic and you want to real, re, be able to reprocess the world. Uh, so it's important that we design everything so that, they, from, that it could be executed in a MapReduce style as well in order to address those things. <clears throat> 
Um, so I'm going to touch on one technique that, that we've been using to do that. Um, in this case, our output, our input data store is HBase, um, and our output data store is also HBase. So, uh, so imagine that uh, um, <clears throat> we we'll go back to that document example. Now, one of the neat things about HBase is that uh, you can min uh, that time is actually something of a malleable concept in HBase, and that everything is written at a specific timestamp, but you can override that timestamp. So let's say in this example, I have uh, uh, one document that's written at timestamp 50, another one that's written at timestamp 100. Um, and so how do I do a rolling upgrade of, of logic and reprocess my whole history? Well, the first thing we can do is deploy uh, a new, our, our new logic uh, using our storm incremental processing. So new data may come in, you know, at, uh, sorry, so new, made it, new data may come in at timestamp 300. Uh, so that gets our new data using our new logic, but how do we retrofit all of our old data without overriding new updates that came in uh, as part of our real-time stream? Uh, and we can actually do that by writing uh, older data with older timestamps in HBase. So this example, um, we have a new entry that came in at timestamp 300, um, but I could run a MapReduce job that goes and writes it at an artificially lower timestamp. So I don't, my newer data will overwrite my older data even though the MapReduce job is being executed underneath a real-time processing topology. Um, so the gist is, is that the, the most recent cell written in HBase doesn't need to be the logically newest cell written in HBase. And you can take advantage of that in order to run a MapReduce job against a set of data without having to worry about overwriting newer updates that may be streaming into the system. Uh, so we're going to take, take this picture and we're going to complete it here. And the, uh, the last major part of this architecture is building search indexes uh, over HBase. Um, so there's a couple techniques for doing this. Um, one is uh, building indexes with MapReduce. And uh, what, what'll hap what's interesting that this is actually a fairly established pattern uh, in that uh, <clears throat> we can build a, uh, a, a solar or a Lucene shard uh, in each map task so we can scale it out uh, per map task. We construct those indexes locally in that map or reduce process, uh, so it's all physically located on the, the map reduce cluster, um, uh, which so it's very scalable. And then once the processing is done, we simply copy the index that's built in Hadoop. We basically R sync it over to our cluster of solar servers. So we do all the work in Hadoop, so we're not competing with queries against those servers. Once we have a new version of our index built, we can synchronize it over to the solar servers um, to get that latest index. Uh, so that works great, um, yeah, assuming, that, that, uh, assuming that your index updates don't need to be use this real-time processing metaphor. So how do we make our index updates faster to complement uh, this MapReduce-style processing? There's a couple ways to uh, do it. One that's kind of a more typical approach that's supported by uh, Solar out of the box is, is to essentially post new records. Uh, so we have some sort of stream of data, we post them to our solar shards, uh, and then uh, they get replicated over and are hosted in the search index. So this works pretty well in a lot of cases. Um, but one of the things that, like I mentioned earlier, is that we have very asymmetric data flow patterns from a variety of clients. Like sometimes we'll have huge bursts. And as a result, a huge burst can overwhelm this system. Uh, so if I have a ton of data being pushed in to the solar shards, um, and we can affect the performance and availability of those solar shards. And there's ways you can mitigate that by creating artificial back pressure. Um, but uh, uh, but the, the, we also have to deal with any transient failures. Uh, so if I have my data stream coming in, uh, what if a solar shard is temporarily unavailable? Um, maybe a, there's a network glitch that lasts you know, only a handful of seconds, but I can't temporarily send that. Uh, you know, I have to queue that up and then be able to try and resend that. Uh, so it adds complexity to how we're pushing data onto our, sol onto our solar servers. So this is workable, but there's complexity there, and it is, uh, it's, it's somewhat vulnerable to spikes or transient failures. So the approach that we've taken to, save the, to, to, to solve this is actually we've somewhat inverted this model in that rather than pushing data to solar, 
um, we've written a customized solar plugin that essentially uh, each shard in our solar cluster is responsible for a subset of data in HBase, and the solar shard actually is executing scans against uh, uh, its subset of data. Uh, so it'll just do a range scan uh, over HBase, um, and that scan will be time-based, so it can scan over a range of HBase and say, what has changed during this period of time? And then it, as it detects changes, um, it can pull items uh, into its index. This turns out to be pretty efficient. HBase has some nice optimization, so if you do a time range-based scan, it, it won't even open, won't even bother looking at um, some of its data files that don't have data in that time range. So this turns out to be fairly efficient. And the other thing is that this really cleanly recovers from any uh, transient volume spikes or failures. Uh, so if there's a temporary outage in the solar server, if it's not pulling data, or there's a huge volume spike in HBase, the solar server is going to pull data from HBase as fast as the solar server can. Um, and since HBase is just, you know, the re just being the read source of data, this doesn't put that much load on HBase. Uh, so this turns out to be a pretty resilient, uh, a, uh, a, a pretty resilient system. Um, and I think that one of the engineers that's working on it is, is actually going to give a talk at that at the next Lucene Revolution conference. So get a chance to see Ben Brown out there. Um, he was the, one of the main architects that, that designed the system. So I highly recommend going to see his talk. Um, so I'm going to close with one more uh, note on, on uh, HBase uh, and how we lay out data. And that is uh, HBase schema tends to get really complicated. Um, and you see a lot of tables that have this sort of pattern in which you have, uh, in the row key itself, you'll have a person and then you'll have some sort of entity that lives, uh, or have a parent entity, then a child, and maybe nul nested multiple times uh, deep. Um, and this sort of data structure is actually very efficient. Uh, it's, it's recommend, I mean, you, if you look through the, the history of, of HBase's mailing list, and this is a common pattern that pops up that's recommended um, because you can, if I want to scan everything that belongs to person one, I can easily set up a scan um, across that person. And since HBase's sequential reads are actually very fast, uh, this, is, this is a good and efficient pattern. Uh, the downside is it's hard to reason about. Um, and a lot of that is because I have to look at, I, I can't look at a single row and say, hey, this is a person. I have to look at the contents of a row in HBase and say, okay, well, this is, this is a, a person address, and this next row is a person name. Um, and so it, it becomes more difficult to reason about because we have to look at that contents of the row. It also mismatches tooling uh, that lives in the Hadoop ecosystem. So a thing like Hive or something like Pig works really well if you think of your data as a tabular format. Um, where you have a bunch of records, and those records follow a, oops, they follow a tabular structure, uh, and so they're all basically the same thing. Uh, in this case, it's very difficult um, to, to get this sort of thing to play nice with those, uh, those models. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we've migrated to a different structure for HBase, and that is uh, essentially a logical parent item per row, and then having a very wide table um, for, many, uh, for all the contents in that row. And you can't think of HBase um, uh, like a, a typical relational model. HBase is very resilient to very wide rows. There's some practical limits, but typically tens of thousands of items in a single row in HBase is not a problem. Um, so this makes the row unit the, the unit locality, so everything that belongs to this person simply exists in that row. It's a tabular layout, so we've been able to take Hive and just simply map it directly onto our HBase structure. Um, it's worked out, uh, worked out really well very easy to reason, uh, reason about. Um, in most cases, there are no loss deficiencies. Um, uh, so uh, the, uh, having a bunch of data in a single row, uh, if you're having tons of updates to that row, you can create contention around that. Um, and then a row can never be split across multiple regions in HBase. Um, so uh, if you have something ridiculously big, then that could be an issue. But to, we have not approached either of these limits in, in our practical use. Uh, so this has been a really great, simple pattern. If you're interested in more on that, uh, there was a talk at, the, at last year's the 2012 HBase Con. Uh, Ian Viral laid, laid this out in, in fantastic uh, form. Um, and so I highly recommend if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at modeling data in HBase, uh, th this talk uh, w was excellent. Um, so it's well worth, well worth the time doing. Uh, so with all that, I'm going to talk about our, where we think a lot of this is going, and that 
Uh, the, the patterns that we followed here, that we've talked about for this, uh, we've been successful uh, doing these sorts of things. Uh, but it remains that complexity of these systems is our biggest enemy. I mean, there's a lot of pieces here and it's difficult to reason about. And I feel like this, that we may be living in a sort of assembly language era of big data in that all things are possible. Um, we can, and that all these patterns that we describe, we can execute, we can run data, very large data sets, we can process incre incrementally, um, but it requires very deep knowledge about how these systems work. Um, there's, there's not, uh, and uh, we have, there's a lot of additional code that you have to write, um, which kind of sets the stage where I expect higher level abstractions are going to emerge for these patterns. Uh, so much like, I don't think anybody should be writing direct MapReduce jobs anymore against the Hadoop MapReduce API. Use, use cascading or crunch or pig or hive. There's no reason not, to not use these frameworks. It's much simpler and much easier to, to build and compose jobs. Um, in this pattern, uh, I think that we're gonna need to, we're gonna see higher level patterns start to emerge for dealing with incremental updates as well as large scale MapReduce processing of this data. Um, I'm not sure what all those patterns are gonna look like. Uh, uh, I think the some are starting to emerge, but one thing I'm sure is that uh, seeing it and being involved in it's gonna be fun. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna open it up uh, to questions. Okay, uh, so the, the question was, uh, how does Crunch uh, compare to something like Storm? Uh, so, uh, interesting, there, there are a fair number of similarities uh, between the two. Um, I, I, the, I'll start with the, the biggest difference is that, you know, Crunch is a way to compose MapReduce jobs. Um, take, I mean, take a, an output of one function, compose it to a, a se sequence of other functions, and pr ultimately produce some output. Yeah, yeah, Crunch is specifically about MapReduce. Um, uh, they are similar in that they, they, tend to, uh, they tend to be models of composing functions together to produce some output. But Storm is really focused, is, you know, Storm is purely focused on real-time processing. Um, Crunch is purely focused on MapReduce. Uh, we use both, we like both. Um, yeah, they're good tools. Yes. Is Edge Base your secondary database? Do you have a main database kind of like Oracle or something? Yeah, so, uh, so the system that I'm describing here, it, its, it's scope uh, is really to aggregate uh, data from a variety of data sources and, pers and, and you know, hold it there. So each one of those data sources will have its own you know, database that is ultimately the, ultimately the source of truth that we're bringing together. Um, uh, so there's, there's a number of databases for the various sources. Uh, at the end of the processing, uh, uh, we will persist a, the data, the output of our processing will persist it in a model that aligns with the needs of the applications. And so uh, how that's persisted in that case uh, depends on really the, those needs. So in some cases, uh, we'll produce and we'll produce, uh, the output will be a simple you know, set of Postgres databases that can be easily queried. Um, in other cases, for other applications, uh, their usage patterns do align with, uh, do align really well with HBase. Uh, uh, so things like really efficient you know, sequential reads or that sort of thing where you don't need more sophisticated query patterns. Uh, so we we have alt we do have a number of database technologies. Um, in some cases, HBase is the right tool for the job, and that is the only database that's used in those applications. In other cases, uh, a, a relational model or some other store is a better tool for the job, and, and we use those there. So we we do have a con like uh, like most <laughs> apparently like most companies, we do have a, a number of different data stores. So the answer is yes. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, can you talk about like maybe the number of uh, kind of like the scale of nodes you're running on each different components? Like you know how many HBase nodes you have, and how many Storm nodes you're running, and how many mm -hmm. Solar indexes you have, just to get a sense of you know how big this is. And second is I can see how this is uh, powering your real-time application, um, mm -hmm. 
where you know you have agreed on the use cases and the logic that needs to be run to answer the question. Uh, what about like ad hoc analysis that data miners want to do uh, against the big data? Are you are they also interacting with against the same um, uh, infrastructure to run their models or experiments? Sure. Okay. Yeah, those are great questions. So, uh, in terms of the the number of nodes that we have, um, we have multiple Hadoop clusters. Uh, some of the products that I've I've shown uh, were developed at different times um, and still run on their own clusters. So, our, our largest Hadoop cluster is is I mean, our first offering was that chart search offering, and um, I don't think we're well over 100 nodes. I don't think we're 200 nodes that to uh, on that yet. Um, and then we have uh, a, a similar number of, of solar nodes that hosted. I I don't know the specifics of that. Um, all of our hardware stacks are fairly conventional based on Hadoop recommendations, so I can know with HBase. Uh, I mean, I th we've upgraded it recently, but I think our newer ones will have 48 gigs of RAM, uh, either eight or 12 core processors, and you know, pretty uh, you know, within the bounds of recommendations uh, there. Um, in terms of, uh, so some of the newer stuff where we're doing real-time processing isn't as widely rolled out as that original chart search. Uh, uh, so in those clusters, uh, we're in tens of, no tens of nodes, I think that, that were 20 and 30 nodes uh, between those clusters. Um, the storm processing itself, we tend to run on virtual machines. Um, uh, it's just general virtual machines. There's all those advantage, there's management advantages of them. Uh, so I don't know exactly how many we run of, the, run of those, but it's probably a similar uh, hardware specification. So tens of machines, but not yet hundreds. Um, and then also analytics, or how are we supposed like to Basically know? ad hoc experiments that people yeah. run against the data, does this all, do they also run against the same cluster? Yeah. Or is it just meant only for the application consumption? Yeah, right, so, uh, so generally they, uh, we, we don't run uh, analytics against the same cluster. Um, particularly in these real-time use cases, because an analytics job, we, we, we could saturate resources in the cluster, and then, you know, which would take away from our time-critical processing. Um, so uh, we actually do a couple things. One is um, uh, H-based replication um, from one cluster to another, and then uh, we'll do thing. Uh, then once we have it in that secondary cluster, uh, uh, we, ha we, use hi we use both Hive and Pig. We kind of have different groups that like them, <laughs> like the different tools. Uh, so those both exist there. Uh, and in terms of more interactive analytics, uh, we actually have uh, a, an MPP system, Vertica, that you know, we'll load. And, and uh, so the so folks that are more comfortable in that sort of environment will just you know, basically treat Hadoop as a large scale ETL system, load the MPP, uh, load Vertica, and then, then do the queries against that. Um, so another Quick question. Um, so you work in a pretty highly regulated environment. Um, so you've had to deal with HIPAA, I'm assuming, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that, how that influenced some of the things you do? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah. So th this, we're, pr we're probably as heavily regulated as, as everybody. Um, so which has a couple of, uh, a number of implications. Like one is that even though we're bringing this data into our Hadoop system, the system still you know, belongs to you know, the, you know, the, 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 client, the client, which is the hospital, or you know, to individual patients. So it's not our data. I mean, so we're basically, a, in HIPAA terms, you know, a business partner relationship, which allows it to, us to host it in our system. Um, but there's also some strong requirements that follow below that. One is, is uh, separation of clients' data, so you, you really don't want to mix them together. So, um, and and we, we do that by basically keeping very separate, you know, rows, uh, key spaces, or, or you know, if when we're writing stuff just HDFS, very you know, separate spaces for each client. Um, and then the other thing that I think that uh, makes us pretty unusual in terms of Hadoop deployments that uh, we actually encrypt everything that we store. Um, uh, just to, to uh, there's actually to, to meet the regulatory needs, um, and as actually as a you know research to our, our clients in case uh, anything gets compromised. Um, and the way that we're actually doing that is is um, uh, uh, we had been using actually encrypted hard drives, but those are really expensive and they have low capacity, don't align with the Hadoop model. Uh, but what we can do, uh, what we've been doing more recently is using OS level encryption, so uh, the Red Hat Lux encryption uh, suite. Uh, so basically just using encrypted disk at the operating system level. Um, when we did some bunch of, so we, we turned that on and we did a bunch of benchmarks um, and we were seeing a, a slight degradation in performance with that, uh, with encryption turned on, but it was within 10%. Um, so the cost savings of using OS level encryption was uh, definitely worth it. All right, so. we have time for one more question. All right, one, one more question, yeah. 
become a situation you have to upgrade the earlier Hadoop or HBase to new versions? Mm -hmm. Is that possible and how almost impossible? <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, upgrading. I mean, so Hadoop has advanced, has advanced to the point where you can do Hadoop upgrades. Uh, HBase, at least you know, the versions that we've been using, you haven't been able to do rolling upgrades of those. Um, so essentially, hopefully we'll get there at some point. Hopefully HBase will get there at some point. I know it's being worked on. Um, so what we've done for upgrades is essentially, um, I, I mentioned how we use H, uh, how we use H-based replication across clusters. So we, we'll take one cluster that's live, we'll make sure that all that data is either copied or replicated to another, um, and then at, at that point, um, we'll, we'll take down, you know, one cluster, you know, upgrade it, and, and there's, there's kind of a, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a blue-green type model where we'll bring one up, and then you have to grab everything that was written while that cluster was down. So it's a fairly, it's an involved process, to be sure. So, and I think I'm out of time, but um, I'll be happy to follow up with any other questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just be up here, so thank you. Thank you.